Welcome to the Washington Heights Church Podcast. We're so glad you're here. Each week, we bring you the latest Sunday message filled with God's Word to help strengthen your faith and deepen your walk with Christ. Whether you're tuning in from home, your commute, or anywhere in between, we're thrilled to have you join our community. So grab a cup of coffee, find a cozy spot, and let's get started. Well, we are entering one of our absolute favorite times of the year here with something called Love Gives, and the master of those ceremonies is up here (laughs) with me, um, Pastor Jimmy. And what we do, especially if you are new to Washington Heights, what we do every week between now and Christmas is we take on an effort that is not about us. It's about our community or sometimes even on the other you side bet. of the world. And we just get involved in something called compassion. And here's how we define compassion. It's showing God's love in practical ways. That's awesome. And so what's coming up in these next number of weeks, Okay, Jimmy? so I want you to put on your seatbelt because I'm going to run through these weeks really fast, okay? Plus, it's in your program if you want to kind of get another view of it. Well, coming next week and, and today especially, you can pick up boxes. We have 323 red boxes that you can take home. Now, who are these boxes for? They're people that work in a dark area of our society with the abused kids. They're DCFS workers, uh, family, child services, uh, the Christmas box, Children's Justice Center. So we have 323 employees that we're going to love and show them God's love by getting them a gift. Pick up a box on your way out. They'll be available. Uh, next week, okay, refugee supplies. Everybody know that we have some visitors to our state now, huh? And so what we want to do is love on them. We're going to do a, a clothing drive. We'd ask that you would get new clothes, dignity. We want to give them dignity. So these are jackets, coats, sweats, gloves, real simple stuff. After that, following week, feed my starving children's coming back. <laughs> We are so excited to have that back. And so it's going to be a little different, though, okay? So you do have to sign up this year, all right? I know, I know. Sorry, I know, but... But, but Jimmy, if I'm new, what is Feed My Starving Children? What if you're new, we're going to pack 248,000 meals over five shifts, about 50,000 uh, meals per shift. And so you have to sign up. You can check out our uh, social media. There'll be a link on there. So if you're interested, bring your family, friends, everything. Go to that link. Sign up ASAP because it will close this year. Okay? So get involved. It'll be awesome. We're also going to give some finances to an organization I'm working with in Salt Lake City that we as a church have been in the past worked with too to be able to sponsor some families coming into our nation and help them out. So we're going to give them finances. On top of that, we're going to do something a little new. We're going to ask you to take a family to lunch or dinner. It's a little scary and different, huh? So we'll have cards and names available with phone numbers, and you can arrange it on your own time. You can go as a family, or you can go as a small group. The thing is, just hear their story. Just interact. Hear their story. It'll be something I think you'll never forget. And finally, we will do a bulletproof vest for two law enforcement departments, uh, Morgan Sheriff's Department and Layton City we're, we're providing finances so they can update all their bulletproof vests. And then we have Christmas Eve and Christmas. Merry Christmas, everyone. We're here. <laughs> <laughs> Is it 2022 yet? <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> And you can see at the bottom there, um, there is a grand total. That's a pretty big number. And you can see it broken down where that comes from. And I'll just say this, that everything designated for Love Gives goes 100%, 100%. to those items. And there are some envelopes on the chair back in front of you there. Whatever's received in there goes entirely to that. And if we get over that amount, which every year that we have done Love Gives, we've gone over Um, we're going to keep giving to those refugee families. Many of those are some of the Afghan families that you've seen on the news who have been just fleeing, you know, ahead of a lot of trouble that has come their way. And a number of them have come here to Utah. It's going to be a great season. Everybody ready? Amen. Okay. We'll see (laughs) you. All right. 
Let's turn our attention to the message for today. So we see that list and we hear what's happening, and I think it's not hard to convince ourselves that those are good things to be a part of. What I want to talk about today is the motive behind it, the fuel that makes that happen. Because what happens on the surface level, sometimes what's beneath the surface doesn't exactly line up with that. Let me begin this way. There was a Harvard business professor named Dr. Clayton Christensen, and he would host reunions of some of his past students at the Harvard Business School, right? These are the people getting great education. They would get great jobs. They were making lots of money. They were having lots of influence. And as these reunions were happening, he noticed that there was a theme almost every single time with every single person. They weren't happy. There wasn't a lot of joy in the room. And it led him to say, why is that? Because they've got top shelf education, great jobs, great income. Why aren't they happy? And so it led him to do some research. Here is his bottom line. Happiness is not about accumulation. It's about contribution. To which I think we would probably say, yeah, that, that sounds really right. You know what I think is really cool about that? Jesus said that about 2,000 years before this. And Jesus is like way ahead of the curve. Here's something quoted in the book of Acts that Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. This is as if Jesus said, you want to know the secret of happiness? It's not making it about yourself at the end of the day. But I don't know if you've noticed this about yourself. I've noticed it about myself. That I can even do something good But even mixed in together with that is something that's about me. Like there are times, you know, I think I've done kind or good things for people. And there was a bit of an expectation along with it that eventually they would do something kind in return for me. And it's amazing how the darkness of the human heart can twist in the direction of me, myself, and I. And so maybe we even look at something that Jesus said, it's more blessed to give. Well, I want to be blessed, so let me do that so that there's something on the other side of that. Here's also what the Bible says about generosity and showing compassion. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and the one who waters himself will be watered. Well, I want to be enriched, so how do I get that? Well, let me be somebody who brings blessing. And so what is that really ultimately about? One more example of what the Bible says. They share freely and give generously to those in need. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. They have influence and honor. Who doesn't want to have influence? And maybe even we wouldn't say it out loud. Who doesn't want to have honor? And so, well, if that's what you got to do to get that, could it be that something good even winds up slanting in the direction of something that's not so good in these hearts of ours? Unless my generosity is rooted in something deeper than me, it will become about me. And I got to tell you, I'll be honest, I hate that about me. And I'm not sure if that's only, you know, my heart. I wonder if there's just this tendency in the human heart that we can lean in that direction. Jesus talked about that one day and how we can get to the place where that compassion and that generosity is genuine. And so let's dive into that. And I think there's something here that allows us to see something beyond what happens at the surface level so that the motive behind what we do is one that is fueled by all the right things. And one of the things I think right up front, you know, when I say generosity, you know, what do we often think of? We think of money, right? And maybe that's our first thought. And while it includes that, what we're going to see from Jesus is generosity and compassion is way bigger than that. It's something that can be so pervasive and makes its way into so many different aspects of our lives. So let's jump in in the Gospel of Luke. He, Jesus, also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. 
two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. So there are two characters in Jesus' story that he makes up. A parable is a made-up story to illustrate a spiritual truth. And when we see tax collector, you know, that's not the most warm, fuzzy phrase, right? We have a lot of people that work for the IRS around here, and, you know, it's not quite as bad, but it's not something we get excited about. And by the way, if you work for the IRS, you see my name come across your desk. Please let me know, okay? I want to be ahead of the curve on that, right? But a tax collector back then, that was a horrible designation for somebody. Why? The Roman Empire had conquered Israel. And so what they did is extorted huge amounts of money, like the spoils of war. We conquer you. We're going to take huge resources out of you because Roman legion armies are not cheap and we need to fund them. And so we need to collect taxes. They called it taxes, but really what it was was just extortion. And so how did the Romans collect that money from all those conquered people? They outsourced it. They outsourced it to people who were natives of that defeated country. And so imagine this, Jewish people working for the Romans, taking money from their own people to supply the Roman Empire and the Roman armies that are holding a spear to their throat. And Rome said, here's how much we want. Anything you get above that and our swords are here at your disposal, you can just keep it. So who would do that? Somebody who's saying, you know what? Relationships don't matter. Respect to the people around me don't matter. I just want a bunch of stuff because I can get really, really wealthy. So that guy is a real, you know, sort of negative character in this story. And then when we see Pharisee, we might think, if we're familiar with Jesus' life at all and the stories in the New Testament, we might think, well, that guy's a bad guy too. Because didn't Jesus have all these run-ins with the Pharisees? He did. But when this story is told, this is actually the person who would be perceived as the good guy. And here's why. Before the Pharisee movement began... The Sadducees were the leaders in the temple, and they were sort of the um, professional religious people, and they were viewed as corrupt. Some of their beliefs were they didn't believe in the resurrection, they didn't believe in heaven, you know, it was sort of a very vague sort of spirituality, and they were also often in collusion with Rome, and so the people said, those guys are not spiritual leaders, we don't know what they are, maybe in our day we'd call them a bunch of empty suits. And so there was this movement that began, a reform movement, movement. And it was called eventually the people who went through it, they were the Pharisees. They took the Bible seriously and they took it literally and they structured their whole life around it. And they were the ones trying to actually live out what God has said. And so in this story, you got a guy who's perceived as the good guy and you got a guy who's perceived as the bad guy. And Jesus continues the story. The Pharisee, and remember they're at the temple, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you. And what would you list if you were going to pray? You know, God, I thank you. And probably we would have a long list of things that we're thankful for. We really sat down and thought about it. You know, yeah, there are issues in our day, but you know what? We have been blessed in so many different ways. God, I thank you what? Take a look at what he prays. God, I thank you that I am not like other men. Extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Isn't it amazing that he prays about himself? Who does that? I don't know about you. You know, I prayed for some other things. You know, I prayed for my football team. I prayed (laughs) apparently not enough last week. Um, The Dallas Cowboys got trampled on by the Denver Broncos. And thank you, Bronco fans, for letting me know. Did you see the score? Yes, I saw the score, okay? But we digress. Right? So this is a guy who is praying about himself. And on the surface level, I got to tell you, though, his actions are really good. Check this out. I fast twice a week. That is foregoing food and setting that time aside to focus on God and to hear from God. That's a good thing. I give tithes of all that I get. A tithe is giving 10% of your income. That's a lot. The national average right now, by the way, in America is about 3%. Interestingly, people under $60,000 give a higher percentage and people above that give a lower percentage, which is kind of an interesting thing that people who make less give more um, percentage-wise, but that's just kind of jump back into the story. And so this guy on the surface though, right, things are really good. He's doing good things, but where has it led him? 
God, thank you that I'm not like a bunch of those losers. And he's looking down on other people. And so what you see on the surface and what's below the surface, they don't line up, do they? They don't match up. Because good actions on the top are not backed up by a heart that is in line with why it happens in the first place. And then Jesus goes on, but the tax collector standing far off, doesn't even want to come near, would not even lift his eyes up to heaven. That's kind of a a sign of humility. But he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And here's somebody who on the surface, what has he been doing? He's been destroying other people's lives, but something's happening beneath the surface. And so what you see at the surface level isn't always what is happening beneath the surface. Whether good things or whether bad things, there's a deeper level. And what we're going to discover is this guy, you know what he's asking for? He's asking for God's generosity in a radical way, a radical way. Here's how Jesus concludes the story, and just like he does in so many, it's the surprise ending that left many jaws open because nobody would view the tax collector as a hero of the story. But Jesus says, I tell you, this man, the tax collector, went down to his house justified. That is a legal term of being made right with God rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exhausted. Oh, exalted and exhausted. (laughs) Because when have you ever done enough, right? Here's what that is all about. Compassion and generosity is not about my wallet, but it's about my heart. That's where it starts. That's where the fuel can reside. And that's where the motivation can come from. And then... Luke, who wrote this account of Jesus' life, puts a story right after this, and maybe you know this about the New Testament, maybe you don't, but in the Eastern mindset, they don't always put things in a linear order, right? We think, well, this happened, then this, and this, and this, and this. We think sequentially. They don't. And they will often organize things thematically. And so you don't always find things in a linear order. And so here's the next thing that Luke says right after that story. Now, they were bringing even infants to him, Jesus, that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. Get those kids out of here. Now, it's hard for us in our day with the value that we place on children to understand that 2,000 years ago, and this was just universal for centuries, nobody valued children. At least not until they were productive because they were a net cash drain to any home until they were actually helping to bring something in. So they were not viewed like the way that we view them. Well, when did that change? You know who had the major influence on it? This guy. But Jesus called them to him saying, let the children come to me and do not hinder them. For such belongs the kingdom of God. And truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And we go, Luke, what in the world does that have to do with a Pharisee and a tax collector who go up to pray in the temple? Seems like whiplash into another story. But I think it has a lot to do with it. Because who are the disciples? They're probably also people who are doing a lot of good things, probably tithing of their income and fasting and doing some of those other things. And all of a sudden, here come these kids. And hey, We're trying to leverage Jesus here. We're on the Jesus train that's going somewhere. Get those kids out of here. We don't have the time or the energy for that. They can do nothing for us. And you know what that story tells us, especially on the heels of the other one? Compassion has many currencies. How about the currency of time? I think we live at a time where there are in an era where people will sacrifice some finances to get more time or to have more flexibility. And sometimes it's easier to swipe my bank card than it is to give somebody my time. 
because I hold that very precious. And could it be that generosity and compassion is um, withholding the most precious currency as I understand it, but doing it in some other way? How about physical or emotional space? You know, I just don't want to get involved with that and don't want to get involved with people and just keep that at a distance. It's so exhausting. It's so hard. And I just don't want to deal with it. And so I can swipe a card, but I don't actually want to get involved in, with somebody. I don't want to be hospitable and open my home. I'll, I'll swipe my card, but I don't want anybody to walk on my nice carpet. Compassion has a lot of different currencies. How about the accounts we keep with people? Maybe there are accounts where we've done good things for people and we think, well, there's going to be something coming back on the other side. Or maybe there are people who have hurt us, they've harmed us, and we think there's going to be a day where that's made right. And until then, I'll hold on to it. Could it be that compassion needs to be exercised in both of those to say, you know, the things we do, no strings attached. And the people have hurt me, you know what? One day... God's going to settle all accounts. I'm not. So what is the key to compassion? And there's a part of this story that Jesus taps into again and again. He does this a number of times because really the tax collector and the Pharisee really picture two ways that human beings throughout all the ages have come up with as a means of salvation. How do we save ourselves? How do we get right? And one is to be the tax collector, right? I'm going to do whatever I please, and I'm going to do whatever it takes, and whoever, as long as I wind up with all the stuff that I think will get me to where I think I should be. Right, just a couple chapters later in the book of Luke, Luke records a story that Jesus told about a son, comes into his father, says, give me my inheritance, I wish you were dead, and he goes off to a far country and blows that all in all kinds of extravagant and wild living, and then when he hits rock bottom, he comes back, right? It's the same picture. I was going to do whatever I want, and I don't care what anybody else says. I'm going to define victory for myself. And in that story, there's an older brother. He stayed home the whole time, and what was he doing? He was doing the chores, And he was doing what was right. One way is to just do whatever we want. Another means of salvation. And this is the one that sometimes gets really confusing for us. We get really, really good. And when we get really, really good, we think that on the other side of that, in some way, shape, or form, God owes me. And after all, God, haven't you noticed that I'm not like all these other people? And so there's a couple different ways we can try to accomplish our own means of getting right with God. And Jesus in those stories time and time again says, you know what, it's neither one of those. And there's one time even he says that tax collectors and prostitutes will come into the kingdom before you Pharisees, before you righteous people. What does that mean that being bad is actually good and good is actually bad? I think what Jesus is really hinting at is this, that when we have taken the route of being really, really good, we often have a hard time understanding that we're sick, that we need the grace of God. Because after all, we've achieved it. But oftentimes, people who run far from God seem to discover in those difficult moments, yeah, I've blown it, clearly. But down the other road, I made it. But did we? So what's the key to this? It's found in the statement that the tax collector says when he's praying in the temple, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And what does mercy mean? There's a couple different words that are translated for mercy in the New Testament. And by far, the most common one is this top word, and that's pronounced elias. And you see that over and over again. What it means is loving sympathy. There are some blind people who cry out to Jesus as he's on his way to Jerusalem and say, Son of David, have mercy, have Elias on us. Have loving sympathy on us. And Jesus does that day and does something pretty amazing. He heals them and they have their sight. But there's a, also an uncommon word, and it's the second word, and that's pronounced um, heli- heliosmos. 
And that one's only used two times. Once in Jesus' story. And I'm going to show you the other one in just a moment. And these words are both translated the same way in English, mercy, but they have a different sense of meaning along with them. Let me tell you what Helosmos in the Old Testament, the picture of what that means. Do you know what this is? And I think you do know what that is. Why? Because we've all seen Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark. That is the ark. And it was this box. And into that box was placed the two stone tablets with the Ten Commandments that Moses brought off the mountain after meeting together with God. And they were placed in that box. And this box was put in the Holy of Holies. And what was the point of putting that law there, of putting those commandments there? The Ten Commandments were never given as a ladder to make ourselves right with God. Instead, they demonstrate that we miss the mark and that God is holy and on our own merits, we cannot come because we have all missed it. One example, one of the Ten Commandments tells us not to long for anything that our neighbor has. Anybody ever done that? You see what your neighbor's driving into his garage and you look at what you're driving into your garage And it can be in a multitude of different ways. I can remember I got the iPhone 12. It was about three weeks later, the iPhone 13 comes out. (laughs) And it's got a better camera. (laughs) We miss the mark. And on top of this box, there's this gold um, top on there. And that is referred to as the mercy seat. That's where the word halasmas would be used. And once a year, a high priest could go into the Holy of Holies and he would sacrifice an animal and he would take the blood of that sacrificed animal and he would take it into the Holy of Holies with him and he would sprinkle that blood on top of that mercy seat and that would make payment for the sins of the people for one more year. And then it would have to be done again and again, and again. The innocent sacrificed in the place of the guilty. So when we think about what that um, tax collector is talking about, let me show you the other time the same word is used. Therefore, he, Jesus, had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service to God to make Helasmas, propitiation for the sins of the people, to make payment, to make atonement. What does atonement mean? The meaning of it's right in the word, at one meant. How are imperfect people made right with a perfect and a holy God? Somebody paid the price, the innocent for the guilty. And when the tax collector was saying his prayer. Remember, this is Jesus telling this story. What did he ask for? On the one hand, this word means, you know, maybe God, give me a little bit more time. Give me a little bit more opportunity to turn myself around. Give me some chance to balance out the things that I have done. It's not what he asked for. He asked for payment. And what's going on beneath the surface of his life is a recognition of what God has done. And what his need is. He cries out, God, be merciful to me. Make payment for me, a sinner. So what does all of that mean? Compassion grows in grace. That's where it begins. That's where the motivation starts. It's the fuel of that. But then it doesn't just sit there. Do we celebrate that? Absolutely. Do we recognize it? Do we learn more about that? You bet. But ultimately, it needs to make its way into all that we are and to become a pervasive part of our lives with our time and with our physical space and our emotional space and with the accounts that we keep with others and compassion has many currencies. And why would we allow that to become more and more a reality of who we are and ultimately what we do? Because we recognize what we needed and that we have received the generosity of God, radical generosity, his payment for our sins. Would you pray with me?
So God, would you place deeply in these hearts of ours a never-ending recognition of what you have done. That people like us needed what only you could do, and that's what you did. And you came to make a sacrifice once and for all time and for every person who puts hope and trust in you. And God, let that be what plays out even over the next number of weeks is just a motive that says we receive so much from a holy God. Why would we do anything less? But let it be with no expectations of what is in return. And God, challenge us in different ways that that compassion would find its way into all that we are and ultimately the things that we do. And thank you for loving us all along the way as you do. And thank you for all that is ours from your generous hand. And we ask and pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. We hope you enjoyed today's message. If you found this sermon meaningful, please subscribe, rate, and leave a review. Your support helps us reach more people and spread the word. Stay connected with us throughout the week by following us on social media at Washington Heights Church on Facebook and Instagram and by visiting our website at whc.faith. For more information and additional resources, check out the podcast description below. Thank you for joining us. See you next week.